you guys could take a seat. Like Nate said, that was uh, an older song-ish if you've been in church since the early 2000s. And there's something so beautiful about singing an old song like that and, and the emotions that it brings back. And I know some of the stories that are going on in this room today, and I don't know some others. But if you're new to church, if this is your first time in church, man, I hope that you leave with an understanding of why we sing and shout and lift our hands and say, how great is our God? And maybe you've been in church for a long time, and maybe you forgot that he's great. So I pray that today's service would just be a moment for you to feel close to God and understand a little bit about his greatness, that he's worth singing for, that he paid the price, that Jesus paid the price on that cross for us, and that's why we gather here. So I know that I've been challenging you guys a lot the past few weeks. So today I want to give you a break and come with something a little bit more encouraging and motivating for you. So if this is your first time here, good news, I've got one of those feel-good messages today. <laughs> so we're going to read out of 2 Samuel, and David is the king of Israel at this point, and he has this army, and within that army he has this group of guys called David's Mighty Men. You would think they would have came up with a more clever name, but apparently back then this is all they had, David's Mighty Men. And he's writing about these men in the verses leading up. To this point here. So 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 20 through 23, it'll be up on the screens for you. It says this. There was also Benaiah, son of Jehodiah, a valiant warrior of Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased down a lion. And I just realized that the slides aren't on the screen because we didn't download them, and DJ's working on that right now, so stick with me. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased down a lion into a pit and killed it. Once armed only with a club, he killed an imposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from this Egyptian's hands and killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as three mighty warriors. And he was more honored than the other members of the 30, though he was not one of the three. And David made him captain of his bodyguard. So today we're going to continue on this series, the second part of our series, Living Big. And our subtitle for today is that big people take risks. Big people take risks. And we're going to dive into this scripture once we get it up on the screens and see exactly what that means for you and for your life. So you guys pray with us this morning. God, we just, we thank you for how great you are, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus, that, that you paid the price on that cross. And I pray that these words that we sing wouldn't just be mindless karaoke words. That we would remember, and maybe we would hear for the first time that there's a Savior that came and paid the price for me. The cost of our sin was death, and we deserve that death, but you took it for us. So God, I pray today and every service, God, that our church wouldn't just be some show, that we wouldn't get up and put our clothes on and put our smiles on and come and play church for an hour. But I pray that we would just be a church that seeks you wholeheartedly. That our worship would, would, would cause you to move, Lord God. And that your spirit would dwell in this place. And that we would encounter you in a new way, Lord. So I pray right now that you would move me out of the way. Any anxieties, nerves that I have, Lord. Even if it's anything that I prepared. That if it's not of you, that you would help me pass over it. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So many of you know that Caitlin and I, we have two kids, two daughters, Glory and Nora, and now they're grown, like grown in the sense that they're old enough that we're out of the diaper stage. We're out of like the small car seats and all those annoying things. And, and sometimes people will ask us like, oh, are you going to have another? Are you going to try for a boy? No. Never. <laughs> the answers are resounding. No, hear me. Kids are awesome, but we do not want to go back to that getting up in the middle of the night diaper stage again. I'm also so blessed to have a ton of nieces and nephews, so, so I love getting to spend time with them and hold them, but it's nice that I get to give them back when they're fussy or poop. But if you've had kids or you've been around people with kids, you know this, that, and they make commercials joking about this, that when you're a parent and you have your first kid, you're on guard against everything, like protecting them at all costs, catching them so they don't fall and don't get hurt. But when you're a parent of a second kid, it's more like, ah, they'll be fine. Are they fell? Is there blood? No, just rub it and give it a kiss. They'll be, they'll be fine. And what I heard recently is that a toddler, as they're learning to walk, it's actually important that they fall. I don't know if you've noticed, but most of the time, unless they're tripped, babies fall backwards. 
And what I heard is that when a baby falls backward, it actually helps their spine get stronger. Now, I am not a doctor, if you didn't know. I am not a physician. I don't know if this is true. It's just what I heard. And it makes for a really good sermon illustration, so stick with me, okay? So the more a child falls at a younger age, the quicker they're going to walk because their spine and their hips are getting stronger every time they fall. And we as parents, we, we want to catch our children when they fall, but actually when we catch them and protect them from falling, it can actually delay them from getting stronger and being able to walk on their own. So it's actually the child's benefit that the more they fall, the stronger they get. And the more they fall, the quicker they'll learn how to walk. And what's interesting is that I got an amen from a baby in the back just now. <laughs> what's interesting is that a lot of us are afraid to fall but sometimes when we fall our faith gets stronger there's a poll that asked people what scared them about taking risks and this poll showed that the majority of people answered that they were scared to fail we are scared to take risks and dream big dreams because we're scared to fail but let me tell you today that when you are taking risks and you're taking steps of faith you falling might actually be for your benefit not a sign of weakness that every time you fall, you're actually building your faith. So today we're going to discuss that big people, people that choose to live big, take risks. We discussed last week that when, when people walk into our church, we want them to, number one, encounter Jesus. And number two, that they would begin to have a vision for their life because of Jesus, for their marriage, for their money, for their kids. Because we don't want to just build a big church, we want to build big people. People that are willing to take risks and take steps of faith. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah that God says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So our hope is that after today, you'd have more of a vision of your life, knowing that God has a plan for you, a good plan to give you a hope and a future. And I hope today that, that we would be a little more confident knowing whose hands our life is in. Because have you noticed that everyone has a plan for your life? Every president, every leader, Every teacher, every coach, every friend, every parent, every relative, your spouse, they always have a plan for you. They say things like, I see you going to that school. I see you marrying this kind of person. I see you doing that type of career. I see, I see, I see. And I think for some of us, everybody has a plan for you, but you don't have a plan for you. And you, you need to be on guard against this because if you don't have a plan for you, you'll chase after somebody else's plan for you. And you better be careful because if you don't see anything, if you have no vision, you'll grab onto anyone's vision. And before you know it, you fast forward 10, 20, 30 years and you realize this, this isn't the life that I wanted. And it's because you didn't see anything. So you allowed yourself to follow someone else's vision for your life. But in this church, we're going to challenge each other to have vision, to dream, to take risks, and to lean into what God has planned for us. The Bible is interesting because some people have chapters and chapters that, that inform us about their life, and other people just have a few verses. But, and and Benaiah is one of these people that just has a few verses. He's King David's bodyguard. So today we're going to take three points out of this scripture that we've read. Point number one is this. God dreams can be disguised as lions. God dreams can be disguised as lions. Hear me. Benaiah is minding his own business. The Bible doesn't say that he's looking or hunting for a lion. It just says that he's walking and out of nowhere, this lion appears in front of him. Now, many of us can think that this is just a fairy tale, but in this church, we believe that the Bible is real and is really detailed. Let's make this even more real. If you were walking through your neighborhood and you come across a lion, would your first thought be, I'm going to go chase it? Thank you for the one person that's with me this morning. <laughs> Probably not. And if your response was yes, you just lied in church. Congratulations. You played yourself. And the reality is that if you were to see a lion randomly, you would think that I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. But Benaiah sees this lion. He's like, oh, I'm in the right place at the right time. And there's just something different about someone who would chase a lion. When they see a circumstance that most people would run from, they run to it. Shout out to any police, firemen, or first responders in the room. For clarity's sake, when, when we refer to lions today, we're referring to God dreams, to our circumstances and our opportunities that God provides us with. So when a, a lion chaser sees something that, every, that everybody else thinks is going to be the wrong place at the wrong time, people living with big faith, lion chasers go, I'm in the right place. This is exactly where I needed to be right now. And I wonder how many of us pray about living big, and then God presents you a lion, and you end up running away from your own answer to your prayer. 
me say that again. We pray about living big lives. And I wonder how many times that in church and in our journals and in our prayers, we think, I want to live a big life. I want to dream big. I want more opportunity. I want to do something big. God, I want to be used by you. And then the next week, God says, you wanted a chance to do something big? Here's a lion. And instead, we run away from it. You want to live and dream bigger? Here's an opportunity for you to chase after what you're asking for. Guys, one thing that is so frustrating about following Jesus is that he never gives us fruit. He gives us seeds. And if you plant them and take care of them, it'll turn into fruit. Because what is a seed? It's an opportunity. It's potential. So maybe you'll pray for patience, but instead of you just magically getting more patient, God gives you an opportunity to be patient. So when God puts a line in your life, it's an opportunity for you to run to it or run from it. Hear me, many God dreams that you will have in your life will be disguised as lions. And let me try and explain this metaphor a little further through my experiences. Our church is eight months old this month. Eight months. But my family and I actually announced that we were starting a church in January of 2020. Two months before a worldwide pandemic. Some of you may remember this. And this was not part of our plan. So we embarked on this two-year journey of building relationships and starting online study groups and doing online services prior to ever getting in a physical location. Two years. And starting this church was a lion for me. It would have been really easy to quit and run away from it. It seemed like we had everything going against us. We had no building, no money, no worship team, no kids ministry plan, no volunteers. In the beginning, it was just me, my wife, my two kids, and the belief that God was creating this dream to start a church. And I was scared about starting this church. I was scared of it failing. So we started online. We had 11 people as part of our first study group. And as we got to the middle of 2021, that had increased to 25 to 30 people. And we knew that it was time to transition to in-person services. And you know what? That was another lion for me. It was, I was scared to be responsible to be leading people to Jesus. I was scared to let everyone down. I was scared of letting God down. I was scared of failing. And to be honest and transparent with you, I'm still scared of many of those same things right now. Some of you at this moment might be like, okay, this isn't the church for me. <laughs> <laughs> but we chased after that lion and now we get to live it out and see some of what god is doing through that dream for retro and i had this recurring thought prior to starting the church and i would tell caitlin that that i would rather try and start this church in jesus name and fail over being 60 years old and wondering what would have happened if we just did it so let me ask you what's more important to you the risk of failure or the risk of sitting What's interesting about risking is that not taking a risk is still a risk. Us deciding not to start the church was still a risk. Us deciding not to transition into in-person services was still a risk. So we had to choose what is a better risk right now to chase a lion that we should not be chasing or to sit and risk losing everyone who was brought into retro because we were too scared to take a chance. I think the better risk was saying, okay, God, I don't feel ready. I don't see any of the things we need to start a church. But if you're in it, I'll chase after it. And now many of us in this church are experiencing hope and love, community, forgiveness, and peace that comes from Jesus. And I believe that many, many more will experience the same things that we have because of this church. But we could have missed out on it if Caitlin and I ran away from the lion. Now, I am not saying all of this to be like, look how great we are. Look how faithful we are. That is not it. We are flawed people and we make a lot of mistakes. I'm saying this because, number one, I will never ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. And number two, God is going to present you with lions your entire life. And you're going to have to decide if you're going to chase after them and risk failing, risk not getting the job, risk not getting the relationship, risk not getting the promotion, risk not getting into that school, risk not starting that business. Or you can sit back and watch the lion after lion run by you. You end up asking God, why didn't I get all these opportunities, God? And God's like, I've been giving you lions for years. You've just been choosing not to chase them. Another interesting part of this story, could you imagine Benaiah going to King David and being like, I want to be your bodyguard. And David's like, all right, cool. Do you have like some kind of resume? He's like, oh, let me tell you about this one time. I was walking by and there was a lion there. Oh, did you kill it? Well, no, I, I journaled about it. 
I saw a lion today, thought about chasing it, but then I decided, better not. Okay, well, have you ever been in battle? Yeah, that one time there were these two Moab leaders. Oh, did you fight them? Well, no, I, I prayed about it, but I ended up not doing anything. All right, well, then have you done anything? Well, this one time I saw this Egyptian warrior. Oh, you, you must have defeated him this time. Well, well, I tweeted about it. I tweeted about thinking about doing it, but I didn't actually do it. So then why are you applying for this bodyguard job? Well, see, I, I've thought about doing a lot of things. You should see my journal and my Facebook memories. There are a lot of dreams I've written down. But did you do any of them? No, no. But I did think about them and pray about them a lot. Guys, I, I don't want our church to be filled with people who sit around and talk about what could have been. We become lion talkers. We need more lion chasers. There are too many people who say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But can I just challenge you today to stop talking about your lions and just start chasing one of them? Yes, you might fail, but guess what? You might not. And I just want to repeat this again so nobody mishears me. I'm talking about God dreams, not like, oh, I have a dream to get a Bentley, and Pastor Mike told me to go and get what I want, so I'm going to go and waste all my money on that today. That is not what I'm saying. I'm talking about when you pray, when you talk to God and you feel like he might be leading you to something, those dreams. Because when you allow God to truly have your heart, he changes the desires of your heart. When you allow God to truly have your heart, he changes the desires of your heart. So if you believe your dream is from him, chase after it, even at the risk of failing. Because I would rather have my pride hurt from failing than my faith hurt by sitting. I'd rather have my pride hurt by chasing and taking risks and failing than my faith hurt by doing nothing and sitting. Because when we chase after what God has for us, it builds our faith. So we need more lion chasers. Go after that job. Start that business. Talk to that guy or girl. Go get that degree. But I'm scared. Good. Do it scared. Do it nervous. Why? Because it builds your faith. Because you have to trust God when it's beyond your own abilities. Again, today is not a motivational TED Talk. I need you to understand this. Okay, God dreams are often disguised as lions. God dreams are scary sometimes. There's a quote that says this. It'll be up on the screen. Ships are safer in the harbor, but that's not what ships are made for. Hear this. Christians are safer in their comfort zones, but that's not what Christians are made for. It's safer to be comfortable. It's safer to not chase the lion, but it's not what you're made for. You're made, you're not made to live in your comfort zone because nearly every God dream you have to be accomplished is going to take you getting uncomfortable. It's going to take chasing a lion, chasing a dream. So if you're looking for a church that's just going to pat you on the back and encourage you to keep living your life the way that you are, this is not that church. Yes, we will encourage you. We're good at that. But we're also going to challenge you to chase after Jesus, to chase after the plans that he has for your life. And if you're here today, hear me. Maybe for the first time, I want you to know that God has a plan for your life. Point number two is this. God dreams are blurry. God dreams are blurry. I hear a laugh, so I know someone's with me. Second Samuel says that not only was he chasing this lion into the pit, but he did it on a snowy day. Okay, so let's get past the point that we're agreeing to chase after a lion. But we are definitely not going to chase it into a pit when it's snowing. Here's what's interesting about snow. It might not blind you, but it does blur your vision, right? Think about when you're driving and it's really snowing. You can like kind of see, but you kind of can't. Guys, if you want to follow Jesus, I have some tough news to break to you. The majority of the time, you're on a journey that's blurry and it's snowing all around you. And if you want to make the decision to follow Jesus, understand that it's going to be a lot of snowy days. Like, I think I could see. I think I know where I'm going, but I, but I really can't see fully. And it won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. I know often we get together our 5, 10, 20-year plans. And I think that if you do that, you might find yourself letting yourself down. Because here's how Jesus works. He shows us a step, but he'll never show us the staircase. He shows us a step, but he never shows us a staircase. Often we pray for God to provide us with peak, uh, complete clarity over things, to open up all the doors and all the green lights to lead me where you need me, Lord. And we'll keep praying those prayers boldly, but understand that most of the time, Jesus doesn't work like that. But what he will do 
is he'll show you a stair. What do I do now, Jesus? You wait for the next one. And before you know it, he starts building the staircase of your life. And then you start making decisions and you're moving forward and getting some momentum. And people will be like, how confident were you in making those moves? Not really that confident. I could not see this coming. And it's easy to look back over your life and say that you would have made those decisions over and over again. But in the moment, it's more like, I, I think this is going to work. I think this is a good idea. I think I kind of see it. I could imagine it. And, and many of us need to learn to be okay with the blurry moments in life because God dreams are often blurry. Side note, if you can see every step of the way, that might be a good indicator that you're not living a God dream, you're living your dream. Let me say that again. It might be a good indicator that if you could see every step of the way, you're not living a God dream, you're living your dream. Because you're not going to see the whole thing. Because God gives us one step of the staircase at a time, and it's so annoying. Come on, God. Why does he do that? Because if he shows you the entire staircase, you wouldn't need him. So God gives you just enough detail to make sure that you remain close to him. October is here. Today's October 1st, and Halloween is upon us. And I hate Halloween, by the way. But when I was in my late teens and my early 20s, it was cool to go to haunted houses. And there was one of my friends who was, who was, it was my first time going, and I was just trying to follow as closely to him as I could as he was leading the way, because when you're on a journey that you've never been on before, you're staying really close to the guide because you don't know what's ahead. The second time I went, I was with my wife, Caitlin, and our friends, and I got to lead because I was familiar with it, and I just got to watch Caitlin pee her pants in terror. <laughs> because when you get familiar with something, doing it over... And over again, you stop needing the guide because you know what to expect. So often God will withhold details because he wants us to depend on him every day. Because following Jesus is sometimes blurry. So we need to stay close to the guide. Our last point today, point number three is this. God dreams aren't stopped by the odds. God dreams aren't stopped by the odds. Many of us might be like, I'll chase a lion if I know the outcome. I'll chase my dreams and get after something as long as I know how it's going to work out. Think about this again. He sees a lion on a snowy day in a pit. Would you suggest that the odds give the advantage in this fight to the human or the lion? Probably not the human, right? Everything about this story gives the advantage to the lion. But Benaiah knew if I chase this lion, I could conquer it despite all the things working against me. So for you and I, if we're going to chase a God dream, we have to stop waiting for the right advantages, waiting for the right odds to fall in our favor. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes 11, 4, it says this, farmers who wait for the perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Read it again. Farmers who wait for the perfect weather never plant. But if they watch every cloud, they will never harvest. Hear this. A Christian who stares at all of the options and, the, and every obstacle will never move. You will never move if you're always waiting for the perfect time. So ask yourself today, what am I waiting for? Because if you're not careful, you'll find yourself waiting for the perfect opportunity your entire life. And guess what? It'll never come. You'll end up being 80 or 90 and find yourself living with regret. There's a study Recently, they asked 100 people in their 90s, what are, what are three things you wish you could tell yourself in your 20s? And they all submitted these lists, but every one of them wrote down somewhere on their list that they wish they would tell themselves that they could take more risks. Take more risks. Because you'll either live with the fear of risk or you will live with the fear of regret. You'll either live with the fear of risk or you'll either live with the fear of regret. And I don't know about you, but I would choose risk over regret. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in my 90s and live with the, regret, with the regret of I should have done that. I should have started that church. I should have started that business. I should have went to that school. I should have taken more risks. There's a quote that says, when a, when a dreamer dreams, even if the dream fails, the dreamer still grows. Guys, can you talk yourself into something? Yes. And you could also talk yourself out of something. 
And it's so easy to talk ourselves out of things. But what if we collectively decided to start talking ourselves into things? But what if I fail? What if it doesn't work out? What if, what if they say no? But what about the other side? What if they say yes? What if it does work out? What if the dream does take off? And most of us are attracted to dreamers. We're attracted to people that take big steps of faith, people who are taking risks and living big. And I want people in our church to be willing to dream big God dreams, to come around the table and say, what if it happens? What if it happens? Because this church started as a what if. And we'll continue to take steps, not because we have total clarity, but because we're willing to take steps and take risks and trust Jesus with the rest. Many of you know this. Back in August, we started a series based around one of our statements as a church that says, we're risking everything for changed lives. And we asked each of you to join us on that journey. But the thing is, is that if we're not really, really willing to actually take risks in our lives, then that'll just remain a cute little slogan that goes on a t-shirt or a sign. But it'll mean absolutely nothing. We've got one shot. We've got one life on this side of heaven. And there's no reset button. I just want to encourage you to choose to live by the mantra that my best is yet to come. How do you know? I don't. But what's the alternative? My future's going to stink. <laughs> Let's lean in to being the super optimistic ones that say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe that God has my best days on their way to me. My best friends are on their way to me. My best days of my marriage are on their way to me. My best birthdays are on my way to me. My best job opportunities are on their way to me. Let's not sit and wait and watch everyone else chase their lion. While we sit here writing in our journals about what we're going to do, let's just get up and do it. There's a quote, last quote here, that says, I hate the word fail. I prefer the word feedback. And it's of this mindset that nobody fails. We just get really good feedback that we're not good at certain things. And so you didn't fail. You just found out what you're bad at. You found out that that wasn't for you. So let's change your mindset that you haven't failed, that you just got some really good feedback to better set you up for your future. So you want to live a big life? First, you have to see a life in the first place. So are you seeing a future for yourself? Are you seeing God dreams? Are you dreaming God dreams? Is there something getting you out of bed in the morning besides needing to pay your mortgage or your rent? When you drive, let me invite Nate back up. When you drive, have you noticed that your front windshield is a lot bigger than your rearview mirror? I hope. <laughs> it's because you're supposed to be looking forward when you drive. You're much more likely to get in a car accident if you spend the majority of your time looking in the rearview mirror. And I think for many of us, we find ourselves crashing our lives by looking back at the past far too often. We're supposed to keep our eyes, our heart, and our feet focused forward and on Jesus. Because all of us, whether we realize it or not, we have lions in front of us. And we have to choose, are we going to chase them or not? Because God dreams are often disguised as lions. And following Jesus is often like navigating on a snowy day. But I promise you, following Jesus, trusting God with your life is worth it. Again, please understand today that the goal of this message isn't to help you be a more positive thinker. That's not it. Please don't confuse me with a motivational speaker this morning that I'm saying, go do you. What I'm hoping to motivate you to do today is to choose to follow Jesus, to pursue God and seek the dreams that he has for your life. Despite everything that you might be counting as a reason why you can't do it, trust God that if he's leading you to it, good news, he can do it. So consider this morning, would I rather live with the regret of failing or live with the regret of not risking? And this morning, I'd like to challenge you to say, God, I don't know what line you have before me, but if it's from you today, I choose to chase after it. Let's pray. God, I really, I really, really hope this message honored you. I really, really hope that this didn't come across as like a church that isn't like secure on your word. I had nervousness with this message, thinking that I was going to come across as one of those churchy motivational talks. But I hope today that, that it was an opportunity for us to read a story about a man named Benaiah who risked everything to chase after something that you put before him. And I pray that our church, that us and our journey with you, Lord God, that yes, there is a lot of 
a lot of moments and, and, and quiet moments with you, but there's also some moments for us to get up and chase after what you put before us. So I pray that you just give us the awareness today to hear and listen and focus on what you have for us in our lives. I didn't say it, your words said it, that you have plans for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us. God, I pray today that we would walk out of here with a renewed confidence knowing that you have got our life in your hands. And it might seem scary right now, but who better to go before us than you? God, I pray that those that need to be encouraged today would be encouraged. Those that need to be challenged would be challenged, God. And I love you and I don't want to do anything apart from you. We just continue to invite you into this space as we get ready to, to worship again, Lord. We love you so much, and we thank you for taking the cross for us. All of this happens because of you. This church apart from you is absolutely nothing. So I pray that no matter what is said from this stage, that we know that we're gathering because of you, that our foundation is on you, and that our lives apart from you are nothing. You are the vine. We are the branches. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I'm going to invite you guys to stand as we sing one last song. And if you need prayer here this morning, Marcella is going to be in this corner and Chris is going to be over here. And if you guys need prayer today, I don't know what each of us are going through, but I don't want you to, to miss an opportunity to come and be prayed for. Nothing weird is going to happen. We're just going to hear your story, talk to you, pray with you, and love you because on this journey towards Jesus, it might be blurry, but good news, you're not alone. Not only is Jesus with you, you have a community here that's with you as well. So don't miss out on this part of church.